Good morning and welcome to uh, another online webinar session from Pay360. Thank you very, very much for your time this morning. I know it's um, some time, a bit of an effort to take a little bit of time out of your day. Hopefully the content that we have been sharing over the past few weeks and months has been of use and uh, if not entertaining, at least informative. Um, obviously all, all payments specific. Today's session specifically is all around using cost effective um, payment channels. Uh, we have run this session before, uh, but today's is slightly different based on the fact that uh, across society things are, are, are obviously changing. Um, today's session, uh, the main content will be delivered by a good friend of mine and colleague James Pickering, who the majority of you will know from site visits and user groups over the past few years. He's a, uh, a specialist in all of the payment services that we provide specifically in integration of line of business systems through to payment systems uh, and the uh, de development of the overall uh, in payment infrastructure. So certainly a knowledgeable chap. Um, um, we'll be running a Q&A today as well. So if you have any questions, um, just wiggle your mouse about, you should see the um, options on screen pop up um, to allow you to ask us any questions that are payment related or, or related to any of the content that we're, we're talking about today. So with, with that, I'm just gonna position um, the uh, session by sharing a few slides, if I could, before I pass over to James. Um, I've seen online um, some information, and this is available for everybody to go and see um, from one of the major UK acquirers, Elevon. They've done some statistic to, statistical um, uh, surveys with Ipsos Mori online around the trends of online spending during lockdown. I think they uh, they surveyed, I think it was either it was either a thousand or four thousand people, one of those two, I cannot remember the exact statistic. But one thing I've seen from the information um, is basically what, what we appear to have done and a side effect of the uh, the COVID-19 outbreak is we've we've basically jumped forward as far as technology and access to services are concerned, possibly around about two to three years uh, on where we would have been and where the industry would have seen that that nice gradual change. As you can see from the information on screen, um, the majority of people who are making payments uh, have indicated that their, their preference in payment, certainly given the impact of COVID-19, would be uh, either contactless, um, and certainly cash has dropped right the way down to a much, much lower level than it was. And also online, uh, and there are specifics around the types of things that people want to spend their money on. Obviously, uh, there are bills aside and essential things like, like rent and council tax, but as a preference to spend their money, uh, it's it's interesting that the majority are wanting to spend cash on things like uh, uh, gardening, home improvement, health and wealth being. It, it seemed almost shameful that that five percent uh, seem to be aimed at children. Although I, I, I presume that they are uh, involved in things like out, outings and uh, and other stuff as as well. But it, it just show you what shows where people mind people's minds and focus are during this 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 time of change and they're, they're, they're trying to almost get back to normal but do it in a slightly different way the interaction is different um as you can see from the stats people want their holidays again to be fair that's what they appear to be missing most of all um but to facilitate that uh we have to ensure that we have absolutely the right digital platforms and the correct forms of interaction to allow our customers to engage with us and, and make payments. Um, we've seen a massive 
change, and this is once again based on COVID-19, um, on the way um, different demographics have now seen a, um, a switch in, in the way they prefer to make payments and the, the way they prefer to transact with you. So, for example, the inclusion of um, priority access lists for, uh, for the elderly, um, uh, being able to go online and use, um, you know, online shopping facilities for, for their for their weekly groceries uh, and uh, and get that delivered. Whereas that was something they, they wouldn't have used historically, but now we've, we have seen through a, a a very very large increase in spend online, so um, e-commerce transactions, that this is now almost a preferred method of transacting. Now, in industry, what we've got to make sure as we is we get that right, because it would be very, very easy for industry uh, payment service providers and merchants to get that wrong and uh, basically distract their customers from using that particular channel because it starts becoming difficult, clunky, unusable. It's not integrated correctly. The actual uh, journey of making that payment isn't as simple as they would like. And I think because of that, we are now at a, a, a juncture where people will be, our customers and your customers will be making key decisions as to how they select and or choose their, their preferred mechanisms of payment. Um, and that's sort of the crux of the message and, and, and what we're going to be looking at today with some of the platforms that we provide uh, to our client base and how to make sure that they use them to absolute best effect. So what I'm going to do with that, with that sort of positioning and opening statement is now pass over to uh, James Pickering, uh, who I introduced earlier on. He'll just introduce himself and then we'll fire over to the main content of today's session. As I say, I'll be monitoring the Q&A, so please talk to us throughout. Uh, we will answer um, and I will speak to you, I'm sure, during the session and later on. So with that, over to you, James. Okay, no, right. Thanks, Wayne. Um, yeah, so today's session is all around using cost effective payment channels and things we've seen over the last sort of three or four months, how things have changed. Um, and actually what we, you know, what we sort of predicted at the start might happen generally has come true. And, you know, we've been looking across industry, looking uh, with you guys at ways things are going to change and people are going to do things differently sort of moving forward. Um, but yeah, before we get into that, first and foremost, Wayne mentioned the Q&A. We've had a couple of questions in there already. Um, I've answered those. I've, I've fired a couple of things back to people. Please do ask questions. You know, we run these sessions for you. Um, there's quite a lot of time involved in setting them up in terms of building a slide deck and, you know, making sure we've got the right message and the right content. And we don't just happen across these things, you know, we sort of build them based on feedback we've had from you guys. So it really does help us to tailor the message that we're, uh, you know, we're delivering and, and helps us tailor um, ultimately, you know, the, the webinars that we run. So please do fire us a message, let us know what you want to see, um, what works, what doesn't work, etc. So. Let's get into this. I've got the slides up on the screen here in front of me. Hopefully you can all see those cost effective payment channels. Um, at the beginning of the, the COVID-19 pandemic or the beginning of the lockdown, um, pretty much all the post offices and all the pay point outlets and pretty much all of the cash offices across the councils and uh, housing associations, etc., all of which are depicted there on the screen in those three boxes. Um, they're pretty much all closed down now. We have seen sort of reopening of those happening over the last few weeks as things have eased a little bit. But what has absolutely been the case is um, even if they have reopened, the way that people are interacting with those services has changed massively. So the issue really comes with these kind of key headings. There is undoubtedly reduced outlet availability. So not all of them have reopened. And actually, I've said this a few times when we've run this session, the post office in my village is actually closed for good. It's never opening again. And the, the next one is um, one of these post offices that's inside a shop and it's in the next village along. So that's something that has absolutely happened because of this situation that we've been in. Um, so, OK, that post office in my village is closed. So I go to the next one down the road and what happens is they're 
uh, as most places are operating strict social distancing measures. So I think they let two people in at any one time, one in the shop and one in the post office part, and the rest of them stand on the lines outside the door. So I know for a fact that people have been going, no, I won't do that. I'll send this parcel a different way, get a courier to come and collect it or, you know, go and make my payment online rather than go to the post office to go and make that payment. So that has had a massive impact on, on those types of services. Um, there are a number of people who are still at high risk uh, and uh, fully isolating. My father is one of those. He's uh, He's got lung problems, so he, um, he is still fully isolating. I've seen him once throughout the sort of period that we've been going through um, and rightly so you know people who are high high risk uh, need to be putting themselves first and, and you know, fully isolating themselves so those type of people are either going to have to get somebody else to go and do this thing for them that's at the post office or the pay point or the the council cash office etc or do as I think most people nowadays are doing using a different payment channel doing that online or over the telephone etc um, Ultimately, the safety of the customers <coughs> is the is paramount. That's the most important thing. And that stretches both physically, which we've talked about a few things there, but also online. So if we're starting to use things like online services or we're actually pushing those more, I mean, I appreciate a number of you probably already using online services and stuff. Um, we need to be making sure that the services we're delivering are secure, especially with things like fraud at the moment being absolutely rife. And, you know, the fraud is doing everything they can to uh, you know, ultimately defraud people and take their money off them, man in the middle attacks and website hacks and all that sort of stuff. There's all kind of horrible things going on at the moment. So we need to make sure that everything we deliver to the customers online, over the telephone, etc., is all as secure as it can be. Um, and ultimately, what we have absolutely seen is an increased demand for using universal credit. But unfortunately, because this was all sprung on everybody, um, a lack of customer choice. So we've unfortunately had to close down a number of payment channels like your post office and your pay point type places have been massively reduced and all the rest of it. You as a merchant might think, no, we've we've taken a call to close our cash office for the minute. Um, so that's a lack of customer choice. And therefore, we need to be looking at delivering different options to those customers so they can still make a payment. So what does that mean to you guys? Um, ultimately, it boils down to these kind of key points here. And really, all of those come down to a cost. So if we look at them in order, I mean, loss of income is pretty obvious. If somebody thinks, I don't know if I'm going to have a job at the end of all this, I don't know if I can afford to make my payment, then they might not pay at all, which is going to give you a loss of income. Um, the fraudulent activity I mentioned briefly there, there's a few problems with that. I mean, first and foremost, obviously, from the customer's perspective, there's fraudulent activity going on. I've had that happen to me myself, my credit card a few years ago. It's not nice. It's a big problem. It's a lot of stress. So that's not great, but it also does ultimately mean at the end of the day, the elephant in the room is you still don't get your money. If the fraudsters have had it, the customers lost a load of money out of their bank account, you still don't get paid. Um, what we have seen, and we thought this might be the case at the start of the lockdown period, and it has actually kind of rung true, um, deferred payments. So people have been thinking, I do want to pay my rent, but I just need to make sure and see that everything's going to be all right or I'll get paid this month or if I can live if you're on furlough, if I can live on my 80 percent of my salary, for example, and all that sort of thing. So people have pushed back making payments, which ultimately has increased the amount of arrears out there. Undoubtedly, you know, we've we've talked to a few customers now who have said, yeah, we've seen arrears go up by, you know, whatever percentage it is. Um, Another thing that actually we, we thought might be the case, but didn't realise it would be quite as much as it would be, is the additional call centre queries. And that's compounded by the fact that you may well have been running a reduced call centre staff. So call centre queries have gone up because there are less options for people to, to make a payment because you maybe close those front, front of house type things. Um, maybe people have been worried. You know, we, we've heard on the news and on the radio and every time you you know speak to any customer services agent, if you've got any problems or any worries of making this payment, um, you know, contact the call centre, let us know. So that has sent call centre queries up and through the roof, actually. Um, and like I say, with a reduced staff or a skeleton staff, it really means that you could potentially get into longer lead times or sorry, longer, you know, longer waiting times on the phone and all that sort of thing which may well lead to customer complaints. And while I haven't heard this specifically from any of our customers when we were talking about it, I know myself in my personal life, I've you know run the electricity company just the other day, actually, and I was in a queue for about 45 minutes, but it was something I couldn't do online and it was really frustrating, but I appreciate, you know, these everyone's in the same position, really, these things happen. And then one of the, the other ones that we've seen happen quite a lot, actually, is 
if people are not using integrated systems, which is a, a session I've been running separately to this. Um, and if it's something that you want to see, we've got it up on YouTube and you know we, we can give you links to that. Um, if you're not using integrated systems, you can potentially find yourself in a situation where there's more erroneous data going into the system. So let's say, for example, you've moved your call center staff home. Actually, a lot of people are now moving back into the office again, but call center staff at home, the integration of their systems isn't as good. You know, they're speaking to customers, they're typing in information, they're maybe sending customers an email saying, go online and make the payment here. It doesn't take a genius to work out that this transposing errors can happen there easily. If you're typing account number in one place and an account number in the other place, it is quite easy to make that mistake. So that's another thing that, you know, potentially is an issue. So let's cut to the chase. What can we do to help you here? Well, um, ultimately it boils down to we are a payment service provider and therefore we have a number of different ways that we can offer customers to make payment everything we do we like to think is cost effective you know we we um we can make sure we deliver things that are cost effective to you and your customer so that you know it's it's a cheap and easy way for them to make the payment everything we do use is the latest security so you might have heard acronyms like PADSS and PCI DSS and all these other different things that are out there in terms of security um we adhere to all of those, so we make sure that we've got all the latest standards in place to protect your customer, but also protect you as a merchant. That's really important to us. And that's great. The security aspect of it is, you know, something that needs to be um, thought about and needs to be in place. But it's not really that good if the system that you're trying to use is difficult to use. So we've had this um, user experience testing that we've done over a number of years that has designed and built the product such that it's easy for staff to use. And you, if you've been involved in any of our version 13, which for those of you that don't know is our latest product release, the version 13 showcase stuff that we've done, you should have seen in there that we've done a lot of work around making this as easy for staff to use as possible. So you've got the security in place, but you've also got that ease of use that means staff can just go click, 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 punch the payment and done. It's easy for them. They don't make mistakes and they like using the software because it is easy and quick to use and it saves them time. But also that extends out to um, all our self-service payment channels, whether that be automated telephone, online payments, etc., that it needs to be intuitive for customers to use as well. So it's all well and good as putting an online payment system in that's the most complicated thing you've ever seen and doesn't work on a mobile phone and they've got to log in through a PC and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's great, but if the customer finds it incredibly difficult to use, let's be honest, they're just not going to use it. They're going to ring the call center or they're going to go down the path of least resistance. So we adhere to all of those um, sort of main philosophies. We've got plenty of different payment channels available there. And that's what, if I can, I want to share with you today, some of the different payment channels that we've got um, and different ways that we've seen customers using these to ensure that things are cost effective and ultimately secure and safe for both customer and merchant. So the first one on the list there is the direct debit system. So we've got a direct debit system in house. Um, you probably are already using something around direct debits. And if you are, that's a great big tick in the box. It's completely hands off. Your customers don't have to see a member of your staff, um, which obviously means you don't then have to worry about having the contact center open, sorry, the, the front of house center open. Um, you don't have to do social distancing measures and all that other sort of stuff. They could ring up, they could go online, set up a direct debit, off they go, great. Over the counter payments, um, I've put a cross in that box there because actually we've seen over the last, I'd say probably three or four months now, over the counter payments has really been something that our core customers, so our, you know, our councils, our housing associations, health, um, all our education customers, all of those kind of guys, they've actually closed their front of house payment channel. That has probably not been taken lightly. I would imagine that's something that you know they've wanted to offer, but for various different reasons around ensuring everyone's safety, those have been closed. Now, actually, over the last few weeks, we've seen some of those starting to reopen. Clearly, there have been social distancing measures put in place, um, but that's something that, you know, you need to really take your own call on that. We can't tell you what you can or can't do. We have the over the channel, over the account payment channel, but, you know, is that ever going to be the same as it ever was? I don't know. You know, that remains to be seen, really. The payment card stuff, so the post office pay point, I've put a question mark there because when we first built this slide deck a couple of months ago now, um, that was pretty much a no-no actually. A lot of people were saying, no, we're not going to uh, we're not going to ask our customers to go to the post office and pay point. It's putting them at a risk they don't need to be at. Again, we've now seen that starting to kind of come back to life again, but that is different, absolutely certainly. Like I say, you know, the post office in my village is closed, so the way I now interact with the post office 
is different than it was before. Pay point outlets in the corner shops and the you know the high street shops and stuff. A number of them have closed. Are they going to reopen? You know, I don't know. I hope so, but I, I don't know. Um, absolutely, it's still a payment channel you should consider, and it's one that I don't think will ever go away. There's a lot of people that use that, and there's a lot of people that that is the way they want to pay. But the way that is going to be interacted with absolutely will will change moving forward. And the telephone payments thing, you might think this should have a big tick in the box, <clears throat> but actually. Telephone payments is only good if you put the security in place to go with it. So we've run a couple of sessions over the last couple of months now around um, securing telephone payments and making sure that that is both a cost effective payment channel, but also a secure payment channel. And what I mean by that is um, historically people have run telephone payments in their office. So they've had a contact center, let's say. And rightly or wrongly, that might have not had the call center masking software installed. So it may have been that the operator was hearing the card number and physically typing that in on their keyboard in front of them, to take a payment from a customer. While not right, and this is where Wayne and I might have a difference of opinion, while not right and absolutely a security hole, um, the old if it ain't broke, don't fix it has sprung to mind a few times and people have kind of carried on doing what they were doing because really those staff are between the four walls and you know they've said, oh yeah, it's a risk, we understand that, but we're in our building. So what obviously happened three or four months ago is all of a sudden, I would say pretty much without exception, um, most of our customers, certainly anyway, let's say that, sent their staff home. So their staff went home, they took a laptop with them, they probably took a headset with them, they might have taken some you know, laptop mice, all that sort of thing, equipment with them. They switched their laptop on at home and they started taking calls from customers at home. Now that in itself is fine. You know, If you're connected to a VoIP system, a voice over IP telephone system, you're picking up the calls at home, that's fine, not a problem. But if you then start to take payments over that uh, home solution, that's where there's a problem. If you've got call center masking in place so the operator doesn't hear that card number and actually more importantly that that call with the customer is then routed out to one of our secure payment services. So, you know, a member of staff says, right, OK, I, thanks for your call, Wayne. Um, you want to pay your rent and it's going to be £150. Type your card number in on your own telephone keypad now. And I, as the operator, don't hear that card number. That's great. That's perfect. But if you're still hearing that card number when the, the member of staff is sat at home, that's a big problem. So I'll cover that in a bit more detail in a minute, but that's why we've got a question mark there. <clears throat> so let's get let's get into that in a bit more detail. Um, the staff mediated telephone system, which is what we were just talking about there. There's a number of key points around that, but the, really the, the thing that I want to sort of get into is showing you what these products look like. You may not have come across them before, maybe you have, maybe you already used them, but I just wanted to show you in a little bit more detail what each of these look like. So let's pick up, first of all, our staff mediated system. Um, you may know it's called pay.net. It's our telephone and actually face to face payments application. It runs within a web browser and that's what you're seeing on your screen there. That application will accept credit and debit card payment over the telephone face to face. It will do cash, check, chip and pin, all those other bells and whistles. But in this type of scenario here where we're talking about telephone payments, credit and debit card can really be taken in two main different ways. Either, as I said, was technically unsecure and how we used to work, ask the customer for their card number and type it in on the telephone keypad. Or as is more pertinent nowadays, ask the customer to type it in on their own telephone keypad so that you never hear that card number and you never, you know, never, never hear it because the system doesn't record it, anything like that. The system supports full shopping basket functionality, so you can take multiple payments in one transaction. And we see that is used pretty much without exception across the board with our customers. You know, maybe it's take a council tax payment and take a rent payment if you're a, a, a house, um, if you're a council that has housing stock still. Perhaps you're a housing customer that takes a rent payment and the garage rent and somebody wants to pay a chargeable repair at the same time. And you log those against individual sub accounts that go underneath that. So, you know, there's all sorts of options in there. We can also do this as a, a one time payment. So is that a simple Wayne's called up? He wants to pay for something. He types his card number and off he goes. That's the payment done. Or as we're seeing more and more people doing now, and I'll touch in on this in a bit more detail in a minute, um, recurring or some people call them planned payments. So Wayne's called up and he says, I don't want to set up a direct debit because I don't trust it. I want to set this payment up on my card to go every month automatically. Or perhaps I've called Wayne and said, Naughty, naughty, Wayne, you're in arrears. You've not paid all of your rent last year and you're 500, 500 pounds in arrears. 
I need to take this from you in the next six weeks. So we'll set you up on a payment plan that every Tuesday takes a payment of X amount, um, you know, automatically off card. Again, there's plenty of options in there and our customers really use that for all sorts of different things. We, have, we don't really mandate what that is. It just depends on what sort of area you want to use it and, and how it works for you. Call masking, I've mentioned. And then lastly, one of the interesting ones on there is the option of doing payment links. So we've run a few sessions now on Wayne's demo to you a couple of times. The idea of sending payment links. Ultimately, what this means is I'm speaking to Wayne on the phone. You know, either I've told him he's in arrears and he needs to make a payment or he's called up and says that, you know, I've got a broke, broken roof tile on my rented property and I, um, I, I need to get that fixed. To get the payment from him, rather than speaking with him and saying, type that in on your keypad, I'd say, all right, Wayne, I can see your phone number ends in 138. I'm going to send you a payment link now. You'll see that arrive on your phone. Follow the link. It'll take you on to a secure payment site and you go on and make that payment. So just to show you what this looks like in a bit more detail, really, um, this application, Pay.net for telephone payments, um, every user's got their own username and password, and that's a really important thing. So everything is heavily audited and everything's heavily logged. So you know what users have done what and what users have taken what payment and all that sort of thing. What's really important about that is when a user logs in, they only see the things that are applicable to them. And by things, I mean the funds. So if they're um, I don't know, they work in the repairs area of a housing association, they might only see repairs on there or perhaps their contact centre and therefore they can see all the different funds for everything. Again, same with payment types. If they're front of house, they might only have cash check, credit card, Mexican jumping beans, etc. Um, or it could be that they're on the uh, the contact centre and therefore they, they're, they're you know, only taking payments through credit and debit card and that's done through the call secure system, through call masking and all that sort of thing. Or it might be actually you're an admin user and all you can see is reporting tools and scheduling tools and all that sort of stuff and you actually have no option to physically take a payment. But that is specific per user or sp actually specifically group. So if we go into that, once we're into the system, um, the authenticated user can then do things like search the back end system. So obviously you don't have to do this. This is something that we have on enabled, our, enabled on our test systems. And I'd say probably most of our customers actually have. But you can search the accounts that are in there. So you can then say if Wayne says, oh, I don't know what my account number is. I can say to him, OK, can you tell me the first line of your address and your postcode? And I'll find him on the list there. And I can say, you know, I can see him on the screen there. His account number is RT1234567. So I'd say to Wayne, OK, can you just confirm what your account number is for me, Wayne? He'll do that. I can select it from the list because I know he is who he says he is. And then if you want, as you should see on the screen there, we can actually return a balance that will then say, you know, I know that Wayne owes £300 on, on this particular account, for example. So once we've selected that, um, we are then taken into the kind of core screen where we can say how much he wants to pay. Because he may well not want to pay the full £300 in this case. It might be he can only afford to pay £50. Or it might be that I say to him, um, this, this repair you're going to go through, is it's £50. And so obviously I type that in on there. I can do all that same sort of stuff, like confirm with him um, his address details and all those other things that I've effectively retrieved from the back end system. And that can be done through a number of different mediums. Generally, it is sort of sorted by two. Um, either a batch file, an overnight load, which historically would have been known as your tape load, um, or it could well be that you're doing a real time type feed where you, actually as you're doing these queries, it goes off to, in this case, the housing system and extracts that balance detail in real time. So once we've chosen the thing that Wayne wants to make a payment for, it might be he's got something else to pay. So like I mentioned before, we've got shopping cart, a shopping basket function. Uh, we can then choose another thing he wants to make a payment for. So an example on the screen here is he's paying his rent. He also wants to pay for parking permit because he can park outside his property, let's say. So he's going to pay for one of those as well. We drop those in the shopping basket, as you can see at the bottom of the screen there. And once we've built that shopping basket, which can be, you know, a huge number of different items in there, we would then progress on to payment. So the payment itself, there's multiple different ways you could do that. So like I said before, it might be that it's a one off payment. I.e., He's going to pay this um, the entire shopping basket in one hit. Or it could be what we do is we set up a payment plan. So as you can see there on the screen in front of you, um, I've got a number of different payment plans available. So in this case, you know, it's council tax payment. It's going to be you can choose a 10, a 10 month payment plan, which is pretty much what we all do. But you could start to look at things like offering a weekly payment plan if you wanted, or perhaps you might have a, a real specific payment plan, which is, you know, every Tuesday or every Monday that it takes payment. Or actually, as uh, Wayne did show on a demo that we did earlier in the week, I think it was, um, 
you can pick specific dates in the future. So it might be, as a lot of our education customers do, colleges and universities, they want to take a payment on specific dates in the future. So let's say, you know, 1st of September and the 13th of December and then, you know, the 4th of January. And you can pick those particular dates moving forward. And when you sign up to this payment plan, the system will automatically charge the card that's saved for this on those particular days. Um, this is an extension of that just showing you. So when you've selected the payment plan, so I'm going to say it's the 10 month payment plan we want to do. I then have options to choose specifically for that payment plan. Which date do I want to take? So every month it's going to take the payment on the 8th, the 15th or the 22nd. You can choose. <coughs> Excuse me. If you were doing a weekly payment plan, you could give the option to the customers of do you want to pay on a Tuesday or a Thursday? Or maybe you would say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. Again, completely flexible, completely up to you. All of this sort of stuff can be configured by yourselves. And basically, once we get to the point of having um, built that payment plan, we now see on the screen in front of us, right, these are the specific days or dates in this case that we're going to go and collect these payments. And actually, you'll see on the right hand side there, these are the amounts on those dates that we're going to take. I can move that around and chop and change it because I'm on the telephone here with Wayne, so I'm in control. Wayne might say to me, actually, can we do another date or can I pay a little bit more each uh, each month moving forward? And I can change that because I'm in control of this. This can also be done online and I'll come back to that. But generally you would uh, give less of this control to the customer and you would sort of lock it down a bit more. So whichever payment uh, payment method we decide to go with, whether we want to do a planned payment or whether we do a one off payment, we basically get to the point where we need to take the card number from the customer. So we're on the telephone with the customer. Like I say, historically, that would have been me say to Wayne, Wayne, can you read me your card number out now? I would type that in on my keyboard here. And obviously I am working at home at the moment. So that brings my PC and all my network and all this sort of stuff into scope of PCI and really opens a can of worms that I think it's generally considered most people are trying to avoid. You know, it's something that we've spent a couple of years now talking about, but that same scenario with the correct sort of call center security in place would basically mean I'd say to Wayne, okay, Wayne, I need to take your card number now. Can you type that in on your telephone keypad, please? He'll type his card number in and what I'll see on the screen in front of me is exactly like you see here. I'll see star, 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 star appearing. <coughs> Excuse me. And that will allow me to not he not hear and not see the card, but know that Wayne has typed something. I can type the expiry date and the security code if I want to, because obviously that's not sensitive card information. So I can type that stuff in if I want. We get to the point of we know all the data is in the system and we hit the authorize button. Once we've hit the authorize button, that will go off and it will authorize that payment in real time. We'll get an authorization code back. If Wayne doesn't have the money in his account, we'll get a decline code back and we're then able to go through, you know, OK, Wayne, would you like to use a different card? Do you want to try re-entering the card information and all that sort of thing? Um, the other option, and I did briefly mention it before, is through a payment link in a browser. The idea behind that is the same scenario there with Wayne. I'd say, OK, right, you need to pay this £100 and 99p. I'm going to send you a payment link now, Wayne. That could either be through email and or actually text message. Wayne will receive that. When he opens that text message, I can see that he's opened his text message. The, the bar will go to here. When he then sort of starts going through the payment process, I can see he's now paying it. And then hopefully he's got the money on his on his card. He goes through successfully. He doesn't decide not to pay it. I will see the transaction is completed. And if I'm speaking live with Wayne, I can say, right, I can see that's gone through perfectly. Wayne, um, what do you want me to do with your receipt? Do you want me to email you it? Do you want me to put it in the post, send it, etc. That receipt is fully customizable. So generally you would have your own logo on there. Um, you, you might want to have your own, you know, text information, all that sort of stuff on there as well. Usually these days those are emailed. So you would type the email address in of the customer and press the email receipt button and off it goes. And really, in essence, in a nutshell, that is how our pay.net telephone system works with those kind of key points that are listed on the screen there. It's a powerful system that we see, you know, we've got a lot of customers using. I don't know what the percentage is, but a large number of our customers do use that application because it, you know, you can use it in, in all sorts of different use cases, really. Moving on from there, um, the next logical step to look at is the automated service. So where we were talking staff mediated, we're saying we're, we're dealing with a member of um, a member of the public on the phone. We're dealing with a customer on the phone. Obviously, that is only going to work inside business hours or potentially, you know, if you're re running a reduced skeleton staff, like I mentioned before, a lot of places are, it might be that you want to start to push customers down the automated route 
so that you are reducing the amount of calls that are actually coming into the call center. So the automated system, um, it is a 24 by 7 service, so it, it runs in our managed bureau. You don't have to host any of that yourself, but you can use your own phone number. So if you want to front that with like a what was an 0845, so an 08300 kind of number, or maybe you want to host it with a um, like a local number, you know, a kind of local rate type number, really so the customer feels happy to ring it rather than it looking like a premium sort of service or something like that, you can you can do that. It will support multiple funds, so you could put on there council tax and rent and sundry debts and garage rent and management fees and all sorts of other stuff that go with it. And the important thing is they're all validated. So as the customer types in that number, it will be checked to say, you know, if Wayne types his, um, his housing account number in there, his, his reference number, when he's finished typing that, it will check it. And if he's miskeyed it, it'll come back and say, I'm sorry, I don't think that's correct. Do you want to try it again, please? Alternatively, it can then bring you back a balance if you want to display that. So Wayne can ring it and say, you know, the system will read back to him, you, you need to pay £300 and he can then go and, and pay his £300. One of the really important things about the system is it doesn't need the full 19 digit reference number. So where other providers out there will require you to type in the full sort of post office or pay point plastic card number that you might have, um, you might have sent out, you don't need that. You can simply punch in uh, your actual rent account number, your actual council tax number, which is usually a lot shorter and usually will be printed on the top of any sort of rent statement or council tax statement that goes with it. All of these systems, actually not just the automated system, can update the back end system in real time. So if you want, let's take the, the housing example there, if you want that rent payment to go and update the correct sub account on somebody's um, housing account, then it can go off and do that automatically through through the, uh, the the process. Or if you don't want to do a real time payment, you could choose to still do an end of day file process, as quite a lot of our customers do in honesty. So how does that look? Well, I've got a couple of obviously it's difficult to play this sort of thing over the air. So I've done a few screenshots just to kind of show what that looks like. Customers called up, they are uh, welcome to the service. So welcome to the automated payments line. It's important to point out you could actually record your own prompts for any of this. So you know, if you've got a local accent that you wanted to have on there, or maybe you wanted to have um, our own voice recording art artist look after this, you know, we can we can kind of choose really. It's up to you. Either you can record them or we can. So they're welcomed. It would generally say welcome to the anywhere council payments line or, you know, another housing association payments line, for example. It'll then run through the options of different things that are on there. So press one to pay your rent, two to pay your garage rent three to pay an invoice or anywhere in between. You know, you can choose what those are. Obviously, each one of those will carry with it its own um, reference validation. So it might be that, you know, a council tax, well, it will be that a council tax validation is completely different to a housing account validation. It might even be that a garage rent validation is completely different to a normal housing rent validation. That's fine, not a problem. We can put those together in there uh, and the system, you know, is intelligent enough to know which one's which, et cetera. So ultimately that customer is gonna make the, the choice of what they wanna pay for. So press one in this case, the system will then prompt them to enter their however many numbers it is, reference number. So uh, how many digits, sorry, reference number. So in this case, it's eight digits. The customer then enters that themselves on their telephone keypad. So blah, 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 type that in on the keyboard. Once they've done that, the system will read it back. So it will always read things back because clearly, you know, if you're on a train or you're sat on a bus or, you're a passenger in a car, even if you're bouncing around, sometimes it's easy to miss key things. Um, or if you're like me and you've got fat fingers, sometimes you just do accidentally miss key things. So the system will always read that back to you. Once you're happy with that, you can confirm that's OK. You hit the start button. OK. Um, we then go through the any balance validation, check digit, mass validation, all that sort of stuff. So like I say, it will validate that and that can be done through a number of different ways. So it might be that you do something as simple as a mask validation on that number. So when they've hit the star key to confirm they've done it, um, it will go through a validation, say this is this amount of numbers or, you know, we've put a, a star in here because it's supposed to have a letter in it or something like that. That's a fairly simple validation because it just says it's eight digits or it's got this many um, numeric characters and this many alpha characters in it. Slightly more complex than that is a check digit routine. So some of you might know that as a modulus check. What that basically means is a calculation is run on that reference number and the la usually the last digit of that is then the, the check digit. Um, the system will cal calculate that, work it out and say, yeah, this is either right or it isn't right. 
And then finally, probably the most comprehensive of these is a balance check, which while it might not actually return a balance, you might choose for GDPR reasons or whatever, you don't actually want to return the balance to the customer. But what you will physic what the system will physically do there is the customers type this reference number. And if you run a balance check on it, it will check its internal balance file or go off to the back end system in real time and say, I've been given this balance. Can you confirm this is correct? And once that's confirmed as correct, it will come back and we'll move on with the process. Obviously, any of those can fail and the customer will be prompted to re-enter their card number. So in this case, we are reading back the balance. Uh, so it'll say, yeah, that's right, first of all. So we know that the, the actual account number is correct. The outstanding balance on this account is, and then it will read it back to the customer. We can then give the customer a choice of what, how much they want to pay. Or actually, if you want, you could give them the choice to, in this case, press the star key to pay the full amount. So the payer in this case just wants to clear the outstanding balance. So they hit the star key. They're then asked to uh, enter their card number followed by the hash key. So they go through and enter their full 16 digit or you know their, their card number um, that's on the front of it. The system will actually prompt for that full long card number. It will prompt for the expiry date for that particular card and it will prompt for the three digits on the back of the card. Once we've got all of those numbers, they'll be asked to hold for a minute while we as the system go off and authorize that uh, card number that's in real time hopefully again we'll get an auth code for that rather than uh, a decline and we'll come back and say to the customer right okay that's okay it's gone through successfully we're now going to debit your account here's a receipt reference number we'll give them the authorization code and ultimately that is the transaction finished so really that gives a 24 by 7 slick service that your customers can call up and actually for sort of 70 or 80 percent of the types of transactions people want to do um it means they can just go off and do that without even having to deal with a member of staff so it is a great service to use and actually we see that um second only in our portfolio of payment channels to our internet payments obviously internet payments has the biggest throughput of anything we've got because everybody is doing stuff online but automated telephony, that actually is second in the pile. So, you know, people are really, really into that and really using it. I'm going to hand over to Wayne just for a minute so I can have a glug of my drink. Um, Wayne, if you wouldn't mind, I know you had some interesting stuff on this. We, I've asked a few times now if you can cover this. Wayne is is heavily into his security. It's, uh, you know, where my thing is integration and online services. His vice, if you like, is security and all the nasty things that go on in the world in that regard. And I know he was involved in some conversations recently um, where some of this stuff came out. And if you wouldn't mind, mate, just, you know, a few minutes on uh, sort of briefing people on that would be great. No, that's absolutely fine. James, please have a drink and everybody bear with me and pause just for one second, literally before I start. And uh, the reason for that, <coughs> excuse my throat, I do get quite, <clears throat> not so much passionate, but almost angry about this subject. Uh, I, and I know a lot of people I speak to, and there will be a lot of um, people on this session today, where I, I'm almost preaching to the converted. You know already there may be issues around compliance or around PCI, and you've possibly had the conversations upstairs. You've uh possibly even written a business case uh based on the risk that you've already identified you may have already signposted all of the supporting documentation that's available on the pci dss website um with regards how you should be securing your infrastructure how your attestation of compliance is absolutely essential with regards it's um it's uh, applicability to your environment and the fact that it may not even be correct. And, and I've seen some hushed corner conversations with regards to compliance and it does really, really get my goat, unfortunately. And that's not very professional, but it unfortunately does. And I feel for you, if you find yourself in this position and or situation, and the fact that you've gone through, so the documentation that we have on screen, for example, the, uh, uh, the information uh, supplement on protecting telephone based payment card data, which was written and submitted by a good, a good colleague and friend of ours called John Greenwood, who uh, uh, who heavily contributed to this. It's got over 15 references to home working within the document itself. 
um, specific information on bring your own device and the hardware that's used. And also the fact when you read some of the other supporting documentation with regards uh, a change in environment or a change in infrastructure, for example, which a lot of you will have gone through. You'll have gone through, a, uh, and I applaud you for this, a really difficult exercise of putting in place a home working environment where you can continue processing as a business. Um, but unfortunately, that change in infrastructure in reality has changed your whole network and security environment. And you are putting not only your organization at risk and your staff at risk. The most important thing, I believe, is you're putting individuals credit and debit card information at risk as well within these environments. And you've got to remember, this isn't your data. It's not your organization's data. This is your client's data and information. So uh, you will be a client yourselves, very probably within the organization you work for. You may pay council tax, for example, or rent within the area you live and you may pay your own organization. And I'm sure you would want that credit and debit card information held both securely, uh, meeting all of the compliance requirements of industry, but also very, very importantly, uh, that meets the legal requirements that are outlined by the ICO under the Data Protection Act. Um, and that's the key point now. Uh, credit and debit card information is included under GDPR. The ICO have got a specific statement on their website as to how they take a stance on credit and debit card information specifically. Um, and make no bones about it, they, they, they do take a softly, softly approach to organisations uh, when it comes to mandating compliance, but they do not take a softly, softly approach when a data breach occurs. Um, a forensic investigation initiated by either, either Visa or MasterCard is one thing, but um, uh, a legal process invoked by central government uh, with uh, a security team all over your network looking as, uh, as to why your incident response plan wasn't in place, why it doesn't cover the new infrastructure that has been um, introduced with home workers, uh, why your PCI DSS attestation of compliance is incorrect. Um, and I've seen this over and over and over again. And having those conversations with individuals that either work in finance or IT or infrastructure, uh, sometimes you'll rub the you know govern governance guys in or um, the guys from privacy and you get a lot of nodding heads. Um, but unfortunately, they find it difficult going upstairs. Uh, and the chief exec is the guy that is basically signing off the attestation of compliance and doing that not blindly because they will see a summary report from um, the IT security officer uh, who has very possibly done his very, very best to secure the infrastructure um, and has a, a lot of other things on his plate as well. But please talk to your own internal data protection officer. You will have one. That is the person within your organization that basically has the power. He's almost like the ship's doctor. He can tell the captain you're no longer in charge. Your data protection officer is the chap that is basically nominated within your organization to ensure that the data you hold that belongs to individual citizens that you are servicing or customers is held and secured to all of the requirements under the law, under the GDPR. It is essential that that is done. And I really can't say any more on the subject. And that's um, that's all I will say. I think on that, hopefully James has had a drink. I'll pass back and you can look at more and more of the services and tools that assist you to get to the point where you can say we are fully secure and PCI compliant and meeting the uh, the law under the Data Protection Act. So on that, I'll uh, I'll pass back to uh, to James if I can. And James's slides. So I'll copy slides up in a moment, James. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so as I told you, Wayne gets very heated about security stuff. It's always useful because if I need a swig of my drink, I can always get yeah, at least five minutes out of him when he starts talking about security. But it is 
it's very useful stuff. It is something that you really do need to bear in mind. And I think something that we will absolutely certainly see uh, as a positive of this horrible period we've all been going through recently is security is certainly going to be something that is on everybody's mind and is going to get better because of this situation we've been in. So anyway, moving on from there. Um, so we can put a tick in the box for those, put a tick in the box for telephone payments. We can put a tick in the box for automated telephone payments and we can put a tick in the box for recurring payments. So what I'd like to do now is go into some of the online payment specific stuff. We've mentioned it a couple of points um, through the session today. We have a couple of different options with online and really they're going to fall um, fall into two main camps. The first is we have this and you can see it on your screen there, fully standalone, we'll call it online payment system. And what that means is uh, it runs on our servers. We host the front end of that. So all of the stuff like the branding and all of the different payment options that you want to put on there. They're effectively things that we apply or you can apply through the, the content management system uh, to the payment site. But that is not linked to any of your um, online payments applications. So it is in that sense standalone. Now, a lot of customers like this because it, there's very little in the way of actual development to go with it. You know that you don't have to develop an online payment system. You don't have to build e-forms, all that sort of stuff. You just put, put into there different things you want to take payment for. Uh, and if you want to build lightweight forms behind that using our standard content management system. It will allow you to do some core and powerful things It'll allow you to do. Uh, so first and foremost, put multiple payment options on there. Like you can see on the screen, I've got council tax and housing rent and business rates and all of those kind of core things. So you would link from your main website and say, want to make a payment? Click this button and it'll take them onto the branded payments page. Uh, it supports shopping basket so people can pay for more than one thing at once on there. There's no log on required to it, so your customers don't have to remember a username and password. They can just go on there, click the council tax button, type in their council tax account number um, and then go on and, and you know make that payment through there. Again, it uses the reference number rather than any 19 digit post office or pay point card number. Um, a useful one again, it's on everybody's correspondence, usually printed and if you've emailed them, it's usually on there as well. So they, they know where that is. It's easy to find. Um, much the same as the telephone stuff, all the data is fully validated and financially coded. So again, if Wayne types his own account number in there, his rent account number, it will validate that to check it's correct. And actually, in a lot of cases, customers have, um, as well as that side of it, you know, the rent account number part of it, they may have a full financial system that goes in the background that needs to know about the actual financial coding. Generally, that's more commonplace in a council world rather than housing association because simply the council have more things they need to allocate funds against. So council tax and rent and garden waste bins and you know all those other things that go with it. So the system will financially code that stuff as well. That also includes doing things like um, if it's a housing customer, sub account coding. So if you want to code stuff against rent account and garage rent and then uh, management fee or you know rare chargeable repair, they're usually sub accounts underneath the top level item and we will code automatically into that as well. We can do a real time update to your back end system. We don't have to. We can still do that. And I've mentioned it a few times, the batch update. So an end of day file that you download and effectively run that batch in overnight, something like that you can do that. But more and more of our customers are now um, enjoying the functionality of the real time service, meaning that those back end systems are updated almost immediately as soon as the payment is made. We've got the latest security stuff in there, so that's actually a key point with it. This box solution here that we've got, and actually the, the thing I'll talk about in a minute, there's no security stuff you really need to worry about. Obviously, if you're applying your own styling and branding, you need to make sure that you're not putting you know, random plugins in there that could be a security risk. But generally speaking, anything like verified by Visa, MasterCard secure code, any of this two factor authentication stuff that more and more people are starting to see into the future stuff like you know retina scanning and facial recognition and all that sort of stuff that's all handled by our system so you just didn't automatically inherit that type of functionality you don't need to look at writing your own applications and stuff to handle that and it supports our payment wallet so the payment wallet uh, predominantly is used for things like the recurring card payments obviously you need to store a card before you can reuse it but you can also use the payment wallet to just make it faster for you to make the payment. If I'm the sort of person that every month goes on and pays my council tax, I click the button, it remembers who I am from last time, type the three digits in off the back of the card rather than the full um, card number and I'm done, payment's made. 
alongside that is the um, the planned payment module. So that planned payment module again allows you to we talked about it for the telephone stuff, but set up in this case e-commerce your own planned payment. It's fully mobilized, as is the core website, actually, so that you don't need to uh, pinch and zoom or use a laptop or anything like that. And actually, both of these different options, one of the important things to point out, and it's a session that I've run completely separately to this, um, they both have integration points available on there. So if you did want to use your own e-form rather than use our front end screens, that's fine. You integrate to our system and then we just skip the front end screens. We just go straight through to the secure card payment entry screens, which are hosted with us and your e-form is integrated to that. Likewise, if you want to start looking at things like planned payments, but you don't want to use our ring fence box stuff solution, you would integrate through that same sort of process and take someone into the planned payment system having started from your e-form. Like I mentioned, all of this stuff is fully mobilized. So generally some uh, people have things like, you know, either a bootstrap theme or they um, maybe they have some sort of HTML5 or other type theme in their uh, style sheet that they use in. We can usually just take that and apply it straight to our, our site, which will give you that kind of core uh, mobilization that you're probably looking for. Alternatively, and some of our customers do this, they write their own style sheets if they've got in-house development. Uh, for mobile, for tablet, for laptop, for widescreen monitor. Uh, and then again, we can apply those to the payments application, which ultimately, and with technology as it is nowadays, like I say, with your, your likes of Bootstrap and with your likes of you know, MD Bootstrap and all the HTML, uh, HTML5 stuff, you really don't need a payment app. There's so much rich functionality with online applications nowadays. You know, I, I've been writing some stuff myself while we've been in a lockdown period. And I've been using some of these new technologies and new functionalities in my own development work. And I'm astounded with some of the stuff you can do. Yeah, OK, you can do the basic things you would expect, like um, display things in a nice mobile fashion. But you can also do stuff like put location pickers and upload files and all that sort of good stuff from a mobile phone. So really, there is no need for an app these days. However, if it is something that your customers are specifically wanting, we do have one of those as well. So we offer full smartphone and tablet payment support as well. And just to give you a quick look at what that actually looks like, again, on the right hand side of the screen, here's a phone. It's a Windows phone in this case. Um, the application, when you've downloaded it and, and verified it and installed it, will then take you in and allow you to do things like manage your payment references, manage the cards that you've got saved on the application. Um, and it will allow you to look at things like your payment history and, and all that other kind of stuff that you would expect with a more rich client app that you would, you would be using. So very quickly, just taking you through, click the make a payment button. I'm then given the options of things that I want to, to make the payment for. So I'm gonna select garage rent in this case. It'll then bring back any balance information specific to my um, reference number. So I can see that on the screen. I can then pick a stored card that I've got held against this. And all I really have to type in is the security code that goes with, goes with it. So I do that, hit the make a payment button, I'm given uh, payment successful in this case because I had the money on my account. It was the right card, etc. And that's it. In a few clicks, the payment application has gone through um, and that sits very much alongside our post office and pay point application. The, the idea is simply that somebody might go out to the post office and pay point, maybe use a plastic card, that sort of thing. Or if you wanted, you can give them a payment app that they can get exactly that same sort of service, but do it through their mobile phone and a rich client app. So we can put a tick in the box for online payments. We can put a tick in the box for smartphone and tablet. We know what the digital wallet's all about, and we can give a double big tick to recurring card payments because we can do that both online and over the telephone. <clears throat> and then really just to close, a lot of this has been around functionality that you maybe don't have at the moment or extending functionality that you currently have using that um, to the best of its ability. Also making sure that people, your customers are safe and secure with all the stuff that we've done, uh, with, sorry, the stuff that we do. But really an important thing about all of this, and I'm not gonna read this word for word, is there is a cost saving to this as well. So there's some numbers on the screen there that say if somebody goes through a self-service type transaction rather than something over the telephone or actually even face-to-face -face type transaction, there are big cost savings to be made. And obviously, you know, those sorts of numbers on the screen there multiplied out by the amount of transactions that you take through that channel can give you significant cost saving. And like Wayne gave us a little bit of a brief on halfway through there, 
a lot of this sort of stuff really does help with the PCI challenge. And it is a challenge. You know, we understand that. For the likes of Wayne, it's probably easy. Tick the right boxes and off you go. Great, no problem. But for us mere mortals that don't live and breathe PCI every day, um, it is a challenge. So making sure that we use all the relevant applications using the right industry standards, making sure that they are level one compliant and all those flyers are level one compliant and all that sort of stuff really will aid you, um, you know, in, in that PCI challenge. So with that, um, I'm pretty much exactly the time, actually. So thank you very much for listening to me. Hopefully we've not lost everybody after I've waffled on for an hour, Wayne. I will stick around for another 10 minutes or so um, at the end of the session. If there are any questions that, that you've got in particular, alternatively, you know, feel free to fire them through to your Pay360 contact. But with that, I'll hand back over to you, Wayne. Thanks very much for your time. Now, it's been absolutely great. That's a really good session again, delivered uh, two points, James. Um, we have had a number of questions throughout the session, and the majority of which uh, through conversation, to be fair, we have um, answered. Um, as James says, we're going to hang around for 10 minutes or so, because I can see there are still questions coming in. So we will get to those um, in the next few minutes. So please remain on if you want to ask us a question. Um, I mean, to summarise and finish, um, hopefully we've shown you through the platforms and applications that James has covered today that Pay360 can offer merchants of all shapes and sizes in all sectors, um, payment security and uh, client satisfaction when it comes to the entire payment journey itself, hopefully automating the majority of the reconciliation issues that you may have and certainly the compliance problems that you encounter along the way. So all I will say on that is throughout uh, the next year or so in your projects of implementation of payment systems and your security journey for compliance. The very, very best of luck. We are here to support you through that journey and assist in any way that we can. Uh, so with that, I'll say goodbye and we will see you again shortly on uh, on another day. Thanks. Bye bye now.